everybody. Welcome to the second very exciting Albert Kahn lecture. This lecture was uh, the brainchild of a very important group of librarians, archivists, historians, professors of architecture, and lovers of Detroit history. My name is James Hanks. I'm the archivist for the Detroit Institute of Arts. It's my pleasure to present the Albert Kahn Research Coalition. We are a group dedicated to identifying an Albert Kahn collection, preserving those collections, and providing educational opportunities to learn about the legacy of Albert Kahn. Coalition members include the Belle Isle Conservancy, Detroit Historical Museum, the DIA, Lawrence Technological University, University of Michigan, and Albert Kahn Associates. One of the projects that we're working on right now is to provide an online portal of Albert Kahn research-related information. It's my pleasure to introduce a colleague, Sarah Kwashny, who's a recent graduate of the University of Illinois uh, Urbana-Champaign, who will talk about the portal. Hello? OK, this works. <laughs> Um, yes, so I'm currently volunteering with the DIA Research Library and Archives, um, and I'm working on this uh, LibGuide Research Coalition portal, which is um, an idea to kind of combine all the different resources of the different coalition members into one space for easy access for researchers. Um, so as you can see here, it's kind of a work in progress right now, um, but at the top is a tab for each member of the coalition. Um, on the home page here, we have a detailed list of the coalition members, as well as a listing of the events of the coalition, um, as you can see on the right um, here. So we're at one of those events today, um, as well as the current research in the field. Um, so highlighted here are the um, <coughs> current works, um, including um, the author who's here tonight. Um, now on the two tabs that I have completed so far for the coalition members, um, this is kind of an idea of what each tab will look like. There's a short informational paragraph about um, who the coalition member is and sort of um, the general overview of the collections that uh, they have ownership of, um, as well as links to the different places to find these resources. Um, so for the DIA, we have the library catalog as well as the finding aids because there is some con correspondence contained in um, collections of papers of the directors, um, as well as the general contact information in case you want to actually go and visit instead of just use it online. Um, and over here we also have the Lawrence Tech tab, um, which I encourage you to explore because in case you don't know, um, Lawrence Tech is home to the personal library of Albert Kahn um, from his firm office um, and is now housed in a recreation of his office as it was um, in his architectural company's office. All right, um, so that's what we have so far, hopefully. Um, it's a work in progress, so I'll be adding more um, throughout the rest of the year. Thank you, Sarah. If there are any members of the Albert Kahn Research Coalition who are here tonight, if you could identify yourselves, take a look around. We'll be here after the lecture if you want to ask questions. We've got our friend from Bell Isle Conservancy over here. We've got our friends from Lawrence Tech. And somebody in the back. Hello, welcome. Lawrence Tech. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Deirdre Tenneberry, the Coalition Co-Chair, Head of Lectures and Exhibitions for the College of Architecture and Design at Lawrence Tech. Welcome, everybody.
All right, I'll start again with uh, <laughs> Mr. Hodges' introduction. Michael Hodges has worked at the Detroit News since 1991, covering the art world and area museums for the past 10 years. Before arriving in Detroit, Hodges worked at the New York Post and the Caracas Daily Journal in Venezuela. His first book, Michigan's Historic Railroad Stations, was named a 2013 Michigan Notable Book by the Library of Michigan. Tonight, we have the great pleasure of having him with us to speak about his new book, Building the Modern World, Albert Kahn in Detroit. And so on behalf of the Albert Kahn Research Coalition, and especially my co-chair, Catherine Phillips, who is seated here, I'd like to welcome Michael and welcome all of you to this lecture. teacher, so if somebody can't hear me, raise a paw. I'm happy to scream. <laughs> um, I am, as advertised, Michael Hodges. I cover the fine arts for the Detroit News, um, which really, never mind the collapse of my industry, is a gig that could hardly be more fun. I get to go to museums and galleries and plays and talks and whatnot, and speak with really interesting, smart people who actually want to speak with you. Which is something that city desk reporters don't always enjoy since they do the hard work. Um, I wanted right at the start to thank Lawrence for playing such a huge role in bringing us all together for these sorts of symposia. I think it's a really cool project um, and one that I hope will continue. Um, I've certainly enjoyed all my experience with it and was honored to be asked to speak. I'm also delighted to be here with uh, Jeff Morrison, my fellow co-author to be, uh, whose project on the public um, sculpture on Detroit buildings sounds like it's going to be a spectacular book um, and a surefire bestseller. Um, as long as I'm thanking people, you know, when you do a book like this, it took about three and a half years. I did all the photography and the research and writing. Um, and I have that annoying problem of a full-time job, so, um, you know. But one runs into all sorts of people and institutions who are of remarkable help. And for anyone interested in Khan, the institutions that were of greatest help to me or most important to me were the Khan papers at the, Al at the Bentley Historical Library at the University of Michigan, which is a lovely place to do research. Um, the Khan papers at the Archives of American Art at the Smithsonian. Um, and I also spent a great deal of time in the DIA Research Library and Archives bothering James um, and his colleagues with questions, as well as at the Cranbrook Archives uh, in Bloomfield Hills. So I got to visit an awful lot of very cool libraries and archives. Um, you know, there's an element of sort of biographizing, if I can use the word, that's a bit like being a, a bit of a voyeur. I mean, I've read Albert Kahn and Ernestine Kahn's love letters. Um, and, you know, good heavens, they were written in the late 1800s, so they're as polite as can be, but it still feels voyeuristic in a kind of thrilling way to get to see the inside of somebody's life through their candid, unguarded remarks. One of the problems or advantages of doing a book on Albert Kahn is that he didn't leave a very big paper trail. Um, I don't think he was the sort of man to keep a journal, apart from a professional journal. Um, the number of letters that survive only number in a couple dozen. Um, <laughs> there was a fire, I'm told, in Kahn Associates in Detroit in 1941, a year before his death, that may have wiped out some of that, that paper trail. So this made this project both eminently doable because there was a real limit on what you had to read through in somebody's difficult, angular, 19th century handwriting. 
Um, but at the same time, there was also sort of a bit of a disappointment that there wasn't more that you could sort of um, dive into. So I want everyone here who's going to end up being famous to promise that you will print out all your emails <laughs> from the past five years so that future researchers have something to work with since none of us actually write physical letters, it seems. All right, and I would be very remiss if I didn't thank Khan Associates in Detroit for the spectacular help they gave me, not least offering me access to all the historical photographs free of charge. Um, authors can rack up this author, did rack up quite a bit of, um, quite a bit in the way of bills uh, by purchasing historic uh, photographs online that were not available through Khan Associates. So that was a great gift, and I'm very grateful to that them for that. Um, I want to cite a couple of previous works that were also hugely important and fun. The sort of Ur biography of Albert Kahn was written by an architect who worked at Kahn Associates and then became a professor at the University of Washington, Grant Hildebrand, who wrote um, a seminal book in the 70s called um, Building for in or Designing for Industry. Um, in the 1990s, the head of Milan Polytechnic University's architecture department, is that fabulous or what? An Italian professor wrote Albert Kahn, Architect of Ford. Both Hildebrand and Bucci's books were aimed not exclusively, but primarily at a professional or academic audience. So there were chapters in each of them that were very technical and hard for a layperson like me to fully grasp. The reason I wrote this book is that this is aimed at a general audience. I hope it's smart seeming and I hope that smart people like it. It's got over 500 footnotes. <laughs> so, <laughs> you do that when you write about history in Detroit so you don't get slaughtered on the internet by people making specious claims about the errors that fill your books. So it's, all right, suckers, you can look up every single citation. I dare you to. <laughs> Um, and then there's one final book. I mean, I, I went through a ton of books, but another book that was just so illuminating was Terry Smith's. He's a professor at the University of Sydney. His epic work called Making the Modern on Modernist Design in America. And Smith, an Australian, um, argues that actually modernism was not born in Berlin. It was not born in New York City. It was born in Detroit with Henry Ford and Albert Kahn, who fill up the first four chapters of that really astonishingly entertaining and smart book. So, if I were to give the elevator pitch for this book, I would say it's the story of a penniless German-Jewish immigrant to Detroit who invented modern architecture, saved Detroit's Diego Rivera murals, and guaranteed victory for the Allies in World War II. It's not a bad day's work. <laughs> in 1942, when he dies at the age of 73, probably of congestive heart failure, had they had CPAP machines, he might have lived much longer, is my guess. But Albert Kahn was easily one of the most famous architects on planet Earth. Um, in the United States, it was sort of Albert and Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, and there was a little bit of friendly competition between the two of them as to who was more famous. But Frank Lloyd Wright is remembered vividly all around the world now, um, justifiably. And Albert Kahn has largely been forgotten outside Southeast Michigan and certain highly uh, detailed architecture texts. And you know, you just sort of want to ask, how can this be? Well, I have one piece of advice. If you're going to die and you want your career to remember, be remembered, don't die at the beginning of a huge world war, because you kind of tend to get swamped. Um, and even in the laudatory, laudatory publications that followed Kahn's death, the weekly bulletin of the Michigan Society of Architects had a big, thick um, issue devoted entirely to Albert Kahn. But 90% of it was about his war work. He, he did a ton of war work beyond his auto factories all turning over to more production. Uh, Khan Associates built any number of air and naval bases in the Pacific Theater and the Atlantic Theater as well, I think. 
Um, in fact, there's some people who make a sort of snide allegation that Khan invents the military industrial complex. <laughs> but in the middle of World War II, early in the war, when it looked like we could really lose, I think that's a little foolish. Um, the other thing, well, before I drop dying in the middle of the war, even my newspaper, the Detroit News, owned by his good friend and former client, George Booth, for whom he built the Detroit News building and Cranber House, the Booth Mansion at Cranber, even the Detroit News, Khan's commercial and academic work, which is a huge part of his legacy in this area, is shoehorned into one paragraph, 11 paragraphs down, on the jump, and they only mentioned four buildings. He got his non-industrial, non-war work out a total of 24 words. And you would have thought that the Detroit papers would have liked to have reminded the readers of some of the overlooked treasures that, that he left us, like the Livingston Memorial Lighthouse on Belle Isle, which is hard to find, but worth the trouble once you get there. But everything got swamped by the war, period. The other thing is, it's not a good idea to say sharp, perhaps very intelligent, but rather sharp, intelligent, critical things about what is becoming the prevailing form of architecture. So Albert Kahn, in many respects, is a foundation stone of modernist architecture that leads to the international style created largely by European architects. Albert Kahn called his factories beautiful. He called them his beautiful factories. But he felt that the factory style, stripped down, reinforced concrete, at least at the beginning, huge windows, you know, just seas of glass, rough familiar buildings, which kind of describes everything since 1945 in the United States. He felt, and I don't say that critically, but you know, it does. Um, he felt that modernist architecture, that factory style architecture was completely inappropriate for anything but factories and industrial installations. So as we'll see when Walter Gropius and Le Corbusier and Adolf Loos and the others begin to adapt the factory style to commercial and residential work, um, Kahn felt it was foolish and sort of an abuse of their clients and said many sharp things about it. After World War II, international style architects and architectural historians and critics ruled the roost. And the international style of modernism becomes a new orthodoxy that you can't rebel against for many years, decades, without being labeled a fool and almost a traitor. So Kahn kind of falls into that vortex. He helps to invent modern architecture, but he sort of disowns his own baby. And he was held in, well, he got slammed. Um, by more recent critics for that, and then ignored, put on the shelf for decades. So I think this is why he disappears. Um, all right. So let's <clears throat> dance through his personal history, which probably a lot of you know, and in fact, many parts of this are probably familiar to a lot of people here. But Albert Kahn and his family uh, came to the United States in 1881. Every published source will say 1880. But thanks to the marvels of Ancestry.com, I pulled up Albert's 1890 application for a United States passport when he was 20 years of age. And it said in two places, we arrived in this country in 1881. Every other source says 1880. And amusingly, his younger brother, Maurice, on his application for a passport like 15 years later, says, oh, you know, we came here in 1880, so I don't know how the family got off track, but I think it's unlikely that a 20-year-old Albert Kahn got confused over what year he arrived in the United States. And that's very unlikely, actually. So the family, the Kahn's are from Germany. Um, Kahn's father, Joseph, was a rabbi. Um, they are cultured but not prosperous people. They moved to Luxembourg um, when Albert is small to live with an aunt. Uh, which I think was probably in part an economic stratagem. Um, and in Luxembourg, they were able to indulge in certain small luxuries like elementary school for Albert and piano lessons. And he was so talented at the piano at seven years of age that his family actually came to regard him as something of a prodigy. 
Um, the way I look at it, and, or like to look at it, is that a certain sort of affection for precision and beauty blossomed very early in his personality. Um, but once they come to the United States in 1881, that's it, no more school. So Albert finishes sixth or seventh grade in Luxembourg and never attends a class formally the rest of his life. Um, their initial, the Khan's initial experience in Detroit was kind of a, a, a case study in immigrant working class hardship, straddling poverty. Um, but there was this, the, the way his sister, his younger sister Molly put it is that she said of their early years in Detroit, we were none too flourishing financially, which I thought was a lovely way of putting it. Um, but Albert lucks out, his mother famously somehow, perhaps through um, personal connection, is able to get her 13 or 12 or 13, 12 or 13 year old boy, a year after he's arrived here, um, an apprenticeship at John L. Scott Architects. John L. Scott built the old Wayne uh, <laughs> County Courthouse in downtown Detroit, the one with the galloping horses on top. And Scott also built most of the homes on East Ferry Avenue, right off of Woodward Avenue, um, where the Inn on Ferry Street is. So Khan works there for a year. He doesn't get paid. That was the routine in the, the sort of informal apprenticeship program of the era. But there was a problem in that he had another job. At dawn, he would get up and he would curry and comb uh, two horses. And he would go in the same clothing from the stables to uh, work at John Scott's office. And the way Khan put it many years later in a speech at Masonic Temple was that I literally got on their olfactory nerves. Um, and they fired him after a little under a year. And according to Khan, and of course people's memories are always a little bit suspicious, but according to Khan, he was not only fired, he was heaved out with abuse raining about his head. He'll never amount to a hill of beans. He lacks direction and insight. And given the sort of explosive potential that he would show at a more kindly architecture firm just a couple years later, it really stands as one of the great honking errors of architectural hiring practices <laughs> in Detroit. Um, and I've always wondered whether John Scott sort of ruefully acknowledged that in later years. So Kahn had already started taking drawing lessons from Julius Melchers, um, who was an artist whose son, Gary Melchers, is in the DIA. Um, and Melchers was able to connect him with uh, George Mason at Mason and Rice. Uh, Mason and Rice famously built the Sonic Temple. They built the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island. Albert May had designed the porch, by the way. Um, and at George Mason, Khan finds the environment that the 13, 14 year old boy needed to, to blossom. Um, he, he commented later that in that office I had fair and kindly treatment. He got to do more than simply grinding ink and emptying waste baskets. Who knew you had to grind ink years ago? I did not. Um, and then he got kindly treatment throughout because that was George Mason's strong point. George Mason, who was only about, I think it's 11 years older than him, not that much older in some respects. Khan becomes, in many ways, at, in his early teens, the principal support for the larger Khan family. Um, so here's Albert at, I think he's supposed to be about 20 years of age here, or maybe a little younger. It's Albert on the right, smiling with the mustache. That's Julius on the far left, who ends up inventing the Khan system of reinforced concrete that revolutionizes factory buildings and his brother Albert's career. The little itsy bitsy boy with the stick or riding crop or whatever that is, is Louis Khan, who ends up being the chief operating officer or CEO of the firm once he comes of age, which I've always thought was sort of amusing given how tiny he is in this picture. And this is Albert on far uh, left, looking rather handsome, in the Mason and Rice offices, which were on Fort Street. Um, he, George Mason took a shine to the boy, and he would sometimes take Albert back to Mason's house for dinner, um, where they would then work on projects after dinner. Khan always said that one of his chief educations came from George Mason, 
after they had finished working on you know, the project for the old YMCA, which Mason did not win, um, and other projects. Actually, no, he won the YMCA. He did not win the old art museum on Jefferson Avenue, which Albert thought was a disgrace and shameful not to have given it to him. Mason, after dinner, would take time and show him like pictures and drawings of great works of architecture, commenting on what was good, commenting on what was bad. Kind of said that was really about most of the schooling that he got. In 1890, as noted, he applied for a passport. He's 20 years of age um, because he'd won a $500 fellowship um, from American Architecture, <laughs> American Architect and Building News. Um, $500 in um, 1890 is about $12,000 today, so it was enough to float a young man watching his pennies for about a year, traveling around Europe doing nothing but sketching. Um, on this trip, uh, which surely must have been exhilarating, um, he meets Henry Bacon, uh, who's a much wealthier, slightly older, much better educated architect um, who some 25 or 30 years later would go on and build the Lincoln Memorial. Um, so it's interesting, you have these two sort of epic architects who meet while backpacking through Europe, each on an architectural fellowship at the time. And kind of also credited Bacon with being the other source of what sort of formal instruction he got in architectural history. So Kahn comes back in 1891. He's just 22 years of age, and he is named head designer for Mason and Rice, which is a pretty big deal when you're 22 years old. In 1901, he goes out on his own. Um, he tries earlier. It doesn't work out. He gets swamped. He goes back into Mason's office briefly, but then strikes out again. One of his early projects was the conservatory on Belle Isle, um, which is a super cool building. Um, and also seems to sort of anticipate, this is kind of biographical BS, but let's say it seems to anticipate the daylight factory, the glass fill factories that he would build for Packard Motor and Henry Ford. Um, Chris Meister, who's an architectural historian in um, Royal Oak, I think, argued that it was Kahn's discovery of reinforced concrete. And we can be sure his brother Julius would play a big part in that because they were both working with recipes and methods for reinforced concrete. Um, that it was reinforced concrete that rescues Kahn's career, which as of 1901 or two, was kind of in the floundering department, not doing so well. Reinforced concrete, obviously, everyone here knows, but it's embedding steel in the concrete before it hardens. And so the concrete grabs the steel and multiplies the strength of said you know, column or beam um, many times. Uh, previous factory construction is often described as dungeon-like. It was masonry construction, slow burning masonry construction. Windows couldn't be very big because the window had to hold up everything above it. Um, with reinforced concrete, you suddenly get you know, beams that are able to carry spectacularly heavy, heavy loads. And what that leads to is building number 10 for Packard Motor Car Company in 1905. And at the time, it, it looks sort of charmingly antique to us now, but at the time, this was blazing with breathtakingly modern. You know, Gothic cathedrals had mastered the art of filling entire walls with glass, but they do that because they got supports on the outside with the flying buttresses. But reinforced concrete allowed Kahn to basically fill up the entire space between column, column, and floor slab, and floor slab with glass, which again is not doing anything to hold up what's up above it. It's all in the beam. And this reinforced concrete sparks a revolution in American factory building. Um, the New York Times, Pulitzer winning late architecture cr critic, A. Louise Huxtable, said that the perfection of reinforced concrete, because it had been around since at least the early 80s, Hundreds of French engineers were very big on it. <clears throat> but recipes for the concrete and the design of the steel members embedded them had to be perfected because otherwise the concrete could pull away from the steel. Buildings collapsed with alarming frequency in the late 1800s and early 1900s. 
And the Khan system is one of a number of systems of reinforced concrete that come on the market at the turn of the century that are durable and reliable. It's sometimes said in Detroit that the Kahn brothers invented reinforced concrete. They did not. But they perfected it. Um, and then built factories, auto factories, factories in the sexiest technology of the new age, which broadcast the virtues of reinforced concrete and the daylight factory with so many windows that you didn't have to rely entirely on electricity, which in 1905 was a bit iffy anyhow. Um, so this becomes the model that revolutionizes factory construction around the world. Um, and as Huxtable points out, reinforced concrete comes along right at the time that American industry was beginning a spectacular expansion, uh, probably very similar to what we've seen in China over the past 15 years or so, very similar sort of coming of age. The other big advantage to reinforced concrete doesn't burn very well. Um, by the way, um, Julius gets a patent in 1903 for the Kahn method. Um, so they build Packard number 10. Packard number 10 is presumably, and it's called number 10 because it's the 10th building that Kahn built for Packard. The previous ones had all been ordinary masonry construction. Henry Ford hears about this, he sees it, and he decides that Albert Kahn is his man. This, by the way, was the interior of the Packard plant. Another big advantage that was sort of implied by what I said already is that you have far fewer interior columns. So you end up with these sort of airy, open loft spaces that were very different from what had preceded them 10, 15 years before. Um, this, by the way, before we drop Packard, is the Packard plant circa 2011, um, when I caught it on a kind of beautiful, snowy day. Uh, much of this, especially on the right, beyond the low gable buildings, has come down. Um, the best thing I did in this project was I rented a helicopter for one hour just before <laughs> sunset in August. It was the coolest thing I have done in 50 years, I swear to God. <laughs> I have friends who live close to Oakland County International Airport. And I almost wanted to swing by the burble at them, but I was just so jazzed afterwards. I didn't want to talk to anyone for fear they would like you know, move the subject off of my exciting ride. Um, it cost $350 for one hour to put a super helicopter, just you and the pilot, which I'd been putting this off for years. I knew I wanted to do aerial work, but I was so convinced it would cost thousands of dollars and I never bothered to research it. And then it was very expensive, but well within sort of the doable. Um, and the evening was just beautiful. The light cooperated um, like nobody's business. So in any event, Henry Ford sees Packard number 10. That leads directly to Highland Park, the Model T complex um, in Highland Park. Um, this, by the way, is the old administration building. The more factory-looking building to the left behind it, I'm told, was the annex to the old four-story, the original four-story building, AKA the Crystal Palace. Because like Packard number 10, it just seemed to have nothing but glass in it. And the impact of Highland Park is interesting because it shows up in all sorts of cultural references. Um, so the French existentialist Céline, in his book Journey to the End of the Night, which is a semi-autobiographical novel, his character in it gets a job at Highland Park and gives this kind of eloquent denunciation of what he felt was the dehumanizing aspect of Highland Park. Here's the gig with Highland Park and these new open, airy, well-lit spaces that Kahn designed. Kahn had the humanist architect's impulse to create decent working spaces that would be so different from what factory workers were used to. Henry Ford wanted airy, open, well-lit spaces so he could cram more machines and more men into ever closer proximity with one another because the greater light and openness made that safe. And Henry Ford was very clear about that. He didn't apologize. So the, the humanistic architectural impulse leads to, in some respects, the dehumanization that we came to know with the modern daylight factory. Um, this is the six-story building at Highland Park that runs along Manchester Avenue, and it's still kind of a thrilling, huge expanse of you know, turn-of-the-century design. Um, I would give money, I 
I'm sure I did when I was a kid. I'm 63. I'm ancient. But I would give money if that powerhouse in the center with the chimneys with F-O-R-E suspended between the tremendous chimney. If, I could, if we could recreate that, I would die a happy man because I think it just visually is such a toot. Um, okay, so now how does Albert connect with modern architecture more generally? Walter Gropius, you know, the legendary founder of the Bauhaus, long before the Bauhaus, at the turn of the century, let's say 1910 or so, 10 or 11, when he is simply a rebellious architect in search of a completely new style, a revolutionary new approach to architecture, which he hadn't yet found, sees pictures of Highland Park. Black and white photographs, scratchy photographs, were passed around from European architect to European architect like sacred texts. And to some extent, Gropius and other Europeans fell on their knees and said, Hosanna, yea, we have seen the future. And Gropius in 1913 publishes this authoritative um, essay in an architectural journal in Germany on American and, and North American uh, industrial architecture. And he has this lovely quote. He says, the newest halls of the great North American trusts can almost bear comparison with the work of ancient Egypt and their overwhelming, monumental power. And there you have modernist architecture, kind of sewn up with a little bow on it. Um, Gropius, when he is designing um, his Fagaswerk, I believe you say, factory outside Hanover a year or two after Highland Park started going up, According to Rainer Bonham, the British architectural historian and critic, Bonham said Gropius had a picture of Highland Park taped above his drafting paper. He also had a picture of this Massachusetts shoe factory by Ernest Ransom, who was a much older engineer who'd been working with reinforced concrete for a number of years and completely independent of time, <coughs> generates design that's very similar. So the push of industrial design was going in this direction, but it's fair to say that Albert Kahn may have been the first or one of the first. Why, in the context of modernism, do we tend to maybe remember Albert but not for Ernest? Because Ernest designed a shoe factory. <laughs> Albert designed factories for the liberation of mankind, car factories. So there's just sort of an imbalance in what I like to call the sexiness of the two factories. And this, of course, is you know, the chassis being assembled at Highland Park. That is the original four-story building, the Crystal Palace. Um, and this is Fagusburg in Hanover. And this epitomizes what Europeans did with the template they got from American industrial design. Were no Europeans building new reinforced concrete factories in 1910 or 1912? Yes, they were starting to. Peter Behrens, in particular, whom Kahn very much admired, had designed some, but they tended not to be as stripped down as Kahn's. And they tended to in, still invoke some references to what we consider design. Uh, Peter Behrens designed this beautiful turbine factory that I should know the name of, but it's got sort of a little gable Greek temple thing on top of it. It's elegant, it's beautiful, but Kahn presented naked modernism stripped down. And Kahn's full impulse was not to create a look, it was to save Henry Ford or Henry Joy Packard money. Maximum floor space, maximum light, minimum cost. And that yielded the birth, as it were, of modernism. So this is just unbelievably elegant. Um, and it's a World Heritage, United Nations World Heritage site, Highland Park, which inspired it, it's not. Um, and it epitomizes what Europeans did with the American example. They took it and they sexed it up. They aestheticized it. They made it breathtakingly beautiful and Kahn would argue, in this case, spectacularly impractical. Because in 1911 or whenever Fagusburg opens, those glass almost meets glass corners, which take my breath away, frankly, they would have been cold as hell in the winter time. And also the glazed brick and whatnot, Khan would have thrown his hands up and just said, you were wasting your client's money to build up your own ego. Um, Henry Ford decides 
So Henry Ford starts building, um, and opens Highland Park in 1910. Many other buildings follow the original building. By 1913, Henry Ford has decided that Highland Park is obsolete. Why? Because it's all multi-story construction. And the moving assembly line really works best if it doesn't have to climb stairs. So there was a sudden like, you know, lightning bolt recognition that, wait a minute, if we design factories that are all on one floor, which is pretty much what factories are today, everywhere, um, then the moving assembly line can work through the entire system and never have to stop. There are no interruptions to elevate or lower something by a floor. However, um, Agnelli, the founder of Fiat, in the mid-teens, after Henry Ford had already decided he was going to junk Highland Park and build the Rouge Complex, where no matter how big the buildings look, they're all one story. Some of the ones built ships originally in old pictures, and so are four stories tall. But that's because you needed it for the halls that they were constructing. But Agnelli falls in love with this old sort of um, image of American manufacturing that was just about to hit the dustbin of history. So he builds a factory complex in Turin, Italy, in the upper left-hand corner of Italy. It's a surprisingly handsome city, by the way. Um, so he builds a Fiat Lingotto complex. And it is really based explicitly on Highland Park and Albert Kahn's designs. The engineer who built Fiat Lingotto was Giacomo Mate Trucco. Um, and he builds a spectacular complex, even though obsolete from the moment it starts. Here's the cool thing, though. At Highland Park, they used to bring the raw materials, all the little bits, up to the roof. And then the bits would fall through the building, metaphorically, and become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until at the bottom, a finished car drove away. In Italy, they did the reverse. They did the more obvious thing. They brought the little bits in on the ground floor, and as the car rose through the structure, it got more and more and more assembled until at the very top, it emerged onto a racetrack, and it zipped around this little racetrack to prove that it actually worked, which is just so kind of wonderful and European and Italian and really, really impractical. Um, but really one of the coolest buildings that's ever been on planet Earth. This, by the way, is all still there, as you saw in that previous picture. Fiat Lingotto is now um, an upscale luxury shopping mall that was renovated by the celebrated architect Renzo Piano, and it has two luxury hotels in it. Highland Park is falling apart, and they tore down the most important building to build that shopping plaza there, which is very necessary. Highland Park desperately needs commerce, but it's a tragedy they have to take down the four-story building. This, by the way, is the double helix ramp that goes up to the roof and that the cars would come down. And it's, you can sneak in and look at it if you ever go to Fiat Lingotto. Uh, and it's really kind of a visual treat. So basically what we have is that as, as a Huxtable, again, going back to A. Louise, the way she defined the international style modernist architecture in progressive architecture in America in 1958 essay was modern architecture is factory style architecture. Here, it's factory style perked up. So on the left you have um, Khan's Detroit Trust Company on Fort Street, um, just a block from the uh, Scott Building, Fort Street at Shelby. And this is classic Khan commercial work. It's backward looking, it's classical. Neoclassical. On the right, you have, I don't know who the architect is, who above the West Fort was, but there you have what his factories unintentionally created. Um, and as I say, he was not happy about this. Uh, Walter Gropius visited in 1935 or 36, Tom was his host, and despite having savaged Gropius' work in print and in speeches, um, calling it strange and bizarre and different for difference's sake, he was a very genial host. Um, but was stricken that Gropius had little interest in seeing the Fisher Building. He just wanted to go to the Rouge plant and that hurt Albert's feelings. Another great example of international style architecture, Mies van der Rohe's Lafayette Towers. Mies van der Rohe always credited Albert Kahn's auto factories as his inspiration. Um, as did Eero Saarinen, who when asked about the GM Tech Center in Warren, those beautiful sort of low buildings with the glazed brick, and somebody said, oh, you got your inspiration from Mies. And he said, no, 
out of time in the early artifacts. So that's how Albert invents modern architecture. Um, how does he save the first Diego Rivera murals? Um, Albert Kahn was a very public spirited guy. He was on the Arts Commission, and he was, which was the board that governed the DIA when the DIA was actually a city department uh, run by the city. And he had voted for um, Diego Rivera's murals. He approved them along with Edsel Ford and the other members of the commission. And here he is with Frida and Diego. And by the way, I've looked through the Kahn family guest book at the Archives of American Art, and on one page there's Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera, which is kind of thrilling, I won't deny it. Um, in painting Detroit industry, um, you, Rivera painted in actual faces of a number of people he had come to like at the museum and elsewhere in Detroit, and this is widely thought to be uh, his homage to Albert Crown. The glasses certainly fit, and so does the mustache. This, by the way, in the academic literature is known as the Mary Foreman which is sort of sweet. <laughs> um, you know, it's, like, it's funny, these things then get repeated and repeated and repeated. Um, the murals at the DIA sparked their own very conservative attacks, mostly from religious leaders um, of both uh, Christian and Jewish persuasion. And what exercised most of the Christians was the vaccination panel, which is one of the square upper right-hand panels. Uh, because it's so clearly based on the familiar Renaissance tableau of the Holy Family with the three wise men, but here are the scientists, and the animals, but here these are animals that you use in, used in developing vaccinations. Um, Albert Kahn's contribution to the murals is this. Even though there were elements of the murals he did not like, he didn't like the huge gods lying on the sides, the naked gods at the top. He thought that was just confusing and weird. Um, but he really liked the big panels, especially this panel, which I believe is the South panel, which is sort of Rivera's uh, rainbow coalition in action. <laughs> Um, of men of many races all pulling together in one direction. The north panel, or the other panel, all the workers are white, and they're all blank faced. They have no individuation. There's a nasty overseer. So they sort of real world and hope for the future. Um, Khan gave an interview to my newspaper the day after the murals opened in 1933, 32, um, and he basically said that anyone who didn't like them was a dog. <laughs> Khan could be very, he was a very polite guy, but he could be very peppery when confronted with, with what he regarded as patent stupidity. Um, and even though he had some reservations about the, the murals, he liked them <laughs> in the main. Um, and he said at the time that he didn't see how anyone could find any fault with this, which was what had generated all the controversy. Father Coghlan, the famous radio fascist priest, got in on the act as well. Um, and Kahn predicted that, in his opinion, the murals, the Rivera murals at the DIA in future generations would become a point of pilgrimage for art lovers the world round. And that has come true, particularly after the bankruptcy, which did such a spectacular job with all the attendant newspaper coverage about, oh my god, they're going to sell the great works at the DIA. So now, I mean, people in Vladivostok, for heaven's sakes, have some idea of the great works at the DIA. I told the DIA's lovely uh, communications director at Pam Marcil that you could not have bought publicity better for your collection <laughs> than this. Why is this interesting that Albert Kahn stands up and he defends the murals very stoutly in my paper, which we buried on page 11, I but never mind, because editorially we were against them. The free press hated the murals too. All of Blue Book Society of Detroit despised Working men and women who have probably never been in a museum were dazzling. Um, Edsel Ford is a good friend of Albert Kahn's, even though Albert is much older. Albert deeply admired Edsel Ford. Um, and about a month or so after the unveiling, and after Kahn has come out in print and said, this, is, this stuff is great, Edsel Ford comes out and says he feels that Mr. Rivera did very well by Detroit's history. And that ends the dispute here. In New York City, you may know, Rivera painted in 1933 a mural at Rockefeller Center called Man at the Crossroads. And he painted Vladimir Lenin into one third of it with these admiring like, acolytes surrounding him. 
Vladimir was not in the cartoon given to the Rockefeller family <laughs> six months before. So the Rockefellers had a fit. And ultimately, they let the management corporation that had sort of that administered the buildings that did not own them to make up their own mind. Well, you know, they're, they're frescoes. You can't just wash them off. The color sinks into the wet plaster. So in New York City, they smashed the Diego Rivera mural off the wall, and they hauled it to the Meadowlands Swamp in New Jersey, which gets a nice kind of airing in the old movie, The Cradle of Little Rock. All right, so that's how he saves the, um, the murals. The winning World War II for the Allies are guaranteeing victory. From 1929 to 1931, I'm going to go through this quickly so we can look at a few pictures before I shut up shortly. Um, from 1929 to 1931, Albert Todd was the official consulting architect hired by the Kremlin for the first five-year plan, which industrialized the Soviet Union. Albert Kahn's designers, he sent 25 men over to Moscow. They had a Moscow office for two and a half years, designed over 500 factories. Albert Kahn Associates <laughs> laid down the industrial backbone of the Soviet Union, which up till that point had been a profoundly primitive economy with little in the way of any industry. And that industrial backbone is what allowed the Soviet Union, by almost any argument, because all those factories produced munitions from about 37 on, to hold the Nazis off. Had the Soviet Union fallen, we would have lost World War II, many historians argue. It was Albert Kahn's factories that provided the wherewithal for the Soviets to not collapse. I think this is a significant salient fact that ought to get mentioned. It seems to me that this is every bit as important as almost any general that you can name. You have to get credit. Now, um, this was the Stalingrad tractor plant, which he designed, which was humongous. He designed three just stupendous tractor plants, all of which ultimately turned over to war production. The Hans did not design them to be munitions plants. That happened later. So let's just take a quick trip through some of what Albert Kahn designed. Um, this was his mansion, is still um, standing. Um, at John R. and Mack Avenue, Kitty Corner from the New Whole Foods. It is the Detroit headquarters of the National, uh, of the Urban League. And they've done a very good job preserving a gorgeous arts and crafts house when almost all the houses around that neighborhood fell into ruin or near ruin in recent years. Um, this is Cranbrook House, the Booth Mansion at Cranbrook. Um, and this is Edsel Eleanor Forbes House based on Cotswold farm architecture in the English countryside. Um, the roof is all uh, rock, slate rock, I believe. Um, and the way it's designed is smaller, thinner stones go up at the very apex, and then they become thicker as they go down. This is the B. Siegel House um, in Boston Edison. B. Siegel, um, old people here like me will remember, was a department store in Detroit. Um, and this house has been recently renovated and is elegant. Um, this is in um, Boston Edison. Uh, this is in Gross Point Farms, I think, on Ridge Road. Um, this is Ann Arbor. It goes without saying, of course, I mean, kind of at some points, around World War II, he had 600 people working for him. Did Albert Kahn design every last building? Does Frank Gehry design every last building that has his name? Probably not. Did I am pay? Probably not. But what Kahn did, and presumably what other great architects did, and this was a Kahn Associates practice, every great project began with sort of a seminar series of meetings where people from across the design fields could sort of have their input. And Kahn describing the head of an architecture firm as being a little like the conductor of a symphony or a quarterback of a football team. Um, so there's been some dispute, oh, he didn't design that, he didn't design that. The buildings wouldn't have gotten built without his say so. So at a certain level, he's responsible for them. This is Boston Edison, and every one of my books has a picture of a cat looking out a window, and that's this one. Um, he also built both Temples Bethel in downtown, De in Detroit and Highland Park. Um, this is the 19, I think, 03 
version, which we know better as the Bon Stealth Theater, which I thought I had a picture of, but I don't. Um, he designed in 1903 the engineering building at the University of Michigan, which <coughs> celebrated arch, which, while the building itself, it's a nice building with sort of silly Baroque towers on it. It's cute, it's nice. It's a very workable, functional building. But this arch, I still argue, is one of the most defining architectural experiences at the University of Michigan. Of all the things that people remember years later, walking through that arch, the compression of that, going from the outside of the cloistered campus within, I think is one of the significant architectural experiences which people feel but don't recognize they feel most of the time. Hill Auditorium, 1911 or 12, I believe. Um, the Clements Memorial Library at the University, which houses a rare collection of Americana, um, and which was Khan's favorite design. I wish that the addition to the graduate building would squash the building so much, but there's not much you can do. Uh, the Graduate Library, Burton Memorial Tower, uh, which was based, by the way, on an earlier L.A.L. Cerny design. Cerny was too busy in the early 30s to actually build his design. He was up to his neck at Cranbrook. Um, so Kahn adapted it and did what Kahn did with other people's architecture. He, sort of, he made it squatter, more masculine, sort of heavier. It took a long time and flag. <laughs> it was very cold. Um, I, you know, the, the, the Burt Memorial Tower, whether or not it is a great building in of itself, and I, th I think it's a cool building at the very least, but it is an iconic building, partly because we see it from so many places, partly because it does something useful, it tells us the time, and it just sort of halts over Ann Arbor in a very satisfying way. Um, he also built Angel Hall. Some people say the central colonnaded portion uh, is a reference to the Lincoln Memorial. It may have been. Um, the Lincoln Memorial plans had already been published. Kahn would have been familiar with them. Uh, this is Kahn and Ernestine in 1912 in Venice with a bunch of friendly pigeons. Ernestine, by the way, was a lovely woman um, and willing to put up with the fact that her husband was first and foremost married to his job, though he was a kindly, loving, father and husband, if somewhat inattentive at times. Um, on the right is the Detroit Trust Company. This is Fort and Shelby, west of Woodward. On the left is the People's State Bank. McKim, Mead, and White, the celebrated New York firm that did Columbia University. Um, and they were Khan's heroes, especially Charles McKim. So the McKim, Mead, and White building goes up in 1900. Khan builds the bank to the right in 1915. And you know darn well that he was probably <laughs> touched and a little amused at being able to build across the street from his heroes. This, by, by the way, the, the bank on the right was originally one third of what it is. They tripled it in the mid 20s. So initially it was this tall, narrow bank with huge columns. It looked a lot like this, which is the Knickerbocker Bank that McKinney and White had designed in, I don't know, 1903 or 1905 in New York. So Khan not only builds across from his heroes, but he takes one of their designs and adapts it to his own design. Um, but the initial bank, before they tripled the size of the Detroit Trust Company, it would have been recognizable, but the styling is all different. Um, the Detroit Athletic Club, 1915, with its new addition on top, which I like better during the nighttime than the daytime, but it's okay, it's okay. Um, a lot of people say that the Detroit Police Headquarters, now the old police headquarters, resembles the Detroit Athletic Club. Well, they're both Renaissance Palazzi, right? Renaissance palaces. The explanation that's frequently given is that when Kahn finished the Detroit Athletic Club, he was offered an honorary membership because he was a Jew. And the Detroit Athletic Club did not admit Jews, as a rule. And he very politely turned it down. There's a legend in Detroit that's a fun legend, but I think apocryphal, that he deliberately designed the police headquarters, which is about three blocks, four blocks away, to resemble it sort of as an insult to the DAC. <laughs> I find it hard to believe that the eminently practical Albert Kahn, who was a businessman first and foremost, architecture is 90% business, 10% art, 
that he would have taken the risk of offending the captains of the American automobile industry for whom he designed most of their plants, all of whom were members of the DAC. I think it's more likely Albert Kahn reused a lot of designs, changing them, but reusing them. And I think he also probably liked the idea of two renaissance, sort of a neoclassical buildings within the eyesight of one another, and sort of visual echoes. That's my theory, and I'm sticking to it. The Detroit News <laughs> Building, 1915, beautifully renovated by Bedrock uh, Real Estate recently. Um, and they re this is an old photograph. They restored the lobby, which when I worked in that building had a drop ceiling 12 feet up. They restored the lobby to precisely this. It's gorgeous. The next time you're on Lafayette between 2nd and 3rd, duck in. It's a public building. Um, and take a gander at the lobby. It's breathtaking. Um, ben Franklin, uh, standing guard. Uh, Jeff Morrison was kind enough to tell me who designed this, but I don't remember at the moment. <laughs> but the Detroit News Building, if you look up, there are four pioneers of publishing standing there. They start with um, Gutenberg, and then they end with Ben Franklin. They're two Frenchmen I was unfamiliar with in between. And then there are these aphoristic legends in between sort of testifying to how great the fourth estate is. Um, the Detroit Free Press building, one of my favorite Albert Cons, 1923, I think, after the Detroit News, um, with a lot of lovely sort of art deco uh, design work on it, faces and whatnot, sort of the Roman dude under the FP. Uh, this is on the fourth street. You've got that sort of gaping medieval looking dude. It's an interesting combination. Um, Detroit Athletic Club, 1917. Some people say it resembles his arts and crafts mansion, sort of cottage style design. Lovely building. Nice golf club, well maintained, by the way. General Motors going up. My father, who lived three blocks away in Palace, so remembered the GM building going up and riding his bike by it. Um, yes, the sky was that. I'm hopeless with Photoshop, so I can't really diddle my photographs, so they're pretty much the way they came out of the camera. Um, the lights in the General Motors building, one of the simpler chandeliers looking straight up. Um, I got up on top of the Argonaut building, which is now the CCS, College for Creative Studies satellite campus, and took a bunch of shots from the roof, which was fun. So this is the top of the GM. You've got at the top, oh, I believe those are Corinthian columns, and on the bottom, well, we don't have a good picture, I believe they're ionic. In any event, two different types of column orders at the top and the bottom, with goddesses guarding everything, a severe grid work of very modern punched in windows filling up the 12 stories in between the classical references. Um, the later Temple Bethel in Highland Park, um, that's the interior Temple Bethel. It's really worth a peek. And it's a, the temple, they're trying to raise money now. It is both a Pentecostalist uh, church, largely African American, and a young group of um, Jewish kids approached the pastor sometime in the last year and said, what if we help you raise money, renovate the building the way it should be, and have some space in here that's shared Jewish and Pentecostal? And the pastor said, God, that sounds great. So they've been doing some very cool work. Um, and it may become a more um, publicly available institution in the future. Uh, Russell Design Center, formerly Mur Murray Auto Body. I just like all that stuff on top. I love those vents. The farm I grew up on had vents like that on top of the barns. 1923, the glass plant. Ford Rouge Complex. This was blisteringly modern. Entirely designed for functional reasons. He's not trying to show off with something that looks sculptural, but it ends up being sculptural, uh, driven simply by engineering practicality. Though I can promise you, he would have loved the fact, I mean, there were four blast furnaces. You had to have the chimneys right outside them. They were all in a row. But I can promise you, he would have been amused at the resemblance to classical columns. The Maccabees building, which resembles the Free Press, was built a couple years later, kitty corner to the DIA. This was built before Woodward Avenue was widened. It gets widened in the mid-30s. 
But the plans for the widening had been announced and were well known, like where the sidewalks were going to run, where the drains were going to be, where the lanes were going to be. Albert built 14 feet into that right away. <laughs> and the city council was so furious that several years later they denied him a contract to build the new terminal at Detroit City Airport, which he offered for $1 million, and instead went with a design by Lewis Camper, who built the boat tower, that was two and a half times as expensive, because they were so forgive me, pissed at Albert Cullen. And Con City would do the same thing again, and I never was able to find an explanation for why he'd done this. Uh, the Detroit en or the Ford Engineering Laboratory near um, the Henry Ford Museum, this was the headquarters of Ford when Henry and Edsel each had their offices there. Kind of modernist neoclassicism. Um, and then um, a fun airplane ride over the news center at sunset with the Art Deco, Fisher Building, and uh, of course the General Motors Building. Eddie Rickenbacker, the famous flying ace, said you could land a plane on the roof of the GM building. I'm not sure where, but he said that. <laughs> <laughs> and this, of course, famously, the GM building was just supposed to be the far right Tower, that there was going to be a look like tower at the other end at Third Street, I think, and in between was going to be this Humongo Tower. This was an early design version before the mansard roof was added. The depression got in the way of this giganto design. Um, almost everything in the new center is Albert Kahn's. The red building on the right is the Argonne. You've got the General Motors building, you've got the Fisher building. Uh, behind the Fisher Building, you have what was the new center building, now the Albert Kahn Building. Fisher Building and the Albert Kahn Building have been acquired by a local firm called The Platform with lots of money and they're sinking $100 million into it. The Albert Kahn Building will become, I believe, condominiums. Um, and Albert Kahn Associates is moving into the Fisher Building. Um, and the Fisher Building is another one of these buildings that, never mind its merits as a work of individual architecture, has this iconic power to it. I also love that you can't see very well, but the guy walking along in the far right is like on the phone. The photographer wanted to crop that out. I was like, no, 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 no. Um, lots of faces at the top of the vision. Like, Who knew? I mean, they're all over the place. Setbacks to, you know, the Fisher Building is a very wide building. If it were a flat surface, it would be overpowering and a little unpleasant. The recessing softens the <laughs> facade. And then, of course, you've got the spectacular interiors. Um, and the, the ceiling design was designed by Giza Morotti, a Hungarian, I believe, architect. Um, and the Lombardi brothers, or Lombardo brothers from New York, painted those tremendous barrel vaulted ceilings and that cruciform design in two months. Is very fast. By the way, there had been water damage on the ceiling of the Fisher Building, and the platform brought in some high tech firm from Cambridge, Mass, that spent two months meticulously restoring. There used to be white, bubbly stuff just in a few places. That's all gone. The lobby of the Fisher Building is much more interesting and animated than it was a few years ago. I recommend walking through. There are actually shops you'd like to go into. Um, just the detail in the Fisher Building. Okay, I'm showing off here, but when you bought a really big fat telephoto lens, what do you want to do? It? <laughs> Collapse distance. Um, I just like the railroad tracks, sort of aiming at the Fisher Building. This is the Albert Kahn Building, um, which is a lovely building that was built in part with the marble that was going to go into the Humongo Building that they ended up not building. Um, the GM Building and the Argonaut which resembles Herman Kiefer Hospital on the Lodge. I'm almost through, I promise. Um, Detroit Savings Banks, there are a number of these. They're look-alike designs, but I think that they're very punchy. Um, and I actually like all the fencing and the poles and whatnot. This is the power plant at the Henry Ford. Um, and it's an early use of modern design, which Art Deco slash modern, which became a con specialty. The Chrysler half-ton truck plant in Warren, um, an elegant industrial cathedral that's gotten a little squashed in the image, but widen it and we'll see what it looks like. The um, Chrysler tank arsenal, and there you get a sense of the 
I mean, this is late, this is 1941 or something, but just the expanse of glass and the light that it sucks in, Albert at his best. And that's the book. I am, by the way, going to be, um, sometime after Jeff's presentation, I will be marketing my wares outside, so you can buy the book. You can't get it anywhere else yet. It doesn't come out for another two and a half weeks. Um, <laughs> it's $40. Uh, I always say don't blame me, blame the press, uh, but it's full of pictures. Um, I brought all my architectural produce with me, so I also have my Detroit Architecture postcards, um, which really you should never leave home without. Um, and my previous book, Michigan's Historic Railroad Stations, which is a lovely tribute to 31 of my favorite stations. Thank you very much. For being here. during the reception um, that we'll have across the hall uh, shortly. So I would like to introduce our next speaker. Uh, my name is Cynthia Simpson. I'm one of the librarians here at Lawrence Tech, and I do have the uh, opportunity, the wonderful opportunity to work in Albert Town's personal work in the library, so I'm very thankful for that. Um, so I'd like to introduce our next guest lecturer tonight. Uh, his name is Jeff Morrison. He's in the audience. I'll point him out in just a moment. Um, he's a historian. And he's also an award-winning photographer. His parents gave him his first camera at age nine. And he has been taking pictures with uh, different cameras ever since. He graduated from Eastern Michigan University and has a degree in history and art. And for over 30 years, he has been a graphic artist. Uh, Mr. Morrison, if you'd like to stand. And uh, Mr. Morrison will introduce his Guardians of Detroit project momentarily, and that has been inspired by his lifelong interest in photography. 